Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Oh, look, you've got a picture of that uh, looks like Kiev with Joe Biden. It's President the, it's, Zelensky. It, is, it, is it the trailer to Fast and Furious 11 or is it Biden and Zelensky in an iconic photo in front of a church in Kiev? Time will tell, Look, Mickey. Looking very tough. It looks like high noon there. They're they're in their gunslinger stance. Yeah, it was um, it was a big event. Um, we are uh, this is close to the one year anniversary of the invasion, and Biden went there a few days before that. By the way, we should say that um, today we're taping on a Thursday. You know, in a, a gracious accommodation by me of your busy, busy. Uh, social calendar. Thank you, Bob. You no, know, listen, it's the kind of guy I am. I'm not even going to mention it. It just, I just do it without mentioning it. But um, one implication of that is that tomorrow is the uh, anniversary, if that's the right term, of the invasion. And some people think that that could lead, you know, Russia will do some big thing on the battlefield. Conceivably, Ukraine might. Uh, so if people are watching this tomorrow and don't understand why we're not talking about that, if it happens. It's because we're taking on Thursday. Also, this will be slightly shorter than usual, and so will the parrot room, but we'll, we can get to that later. Anyway, one year ago, tomorrow, they invaded. You know, I was uh, listening to the uh, Russians with Attitude podcast, you know, these uh, pro-invasion Russian nationalists. Right. And they said something that is clearly kind of right. They said, you know, a year ago, the expectation was that the Russian military would do well and the Russian economy wouldn't. And that's been exactly the opposite. The Russian economy has held up much better than people thought. Of course, the Russian military hasn't done so well. We can talk to that. But on the on the Russian economy front, I mean, one reason uh, we have not succeeded in destroying the Russian economy and bringing Putin to his knees uh, in that along that dimension is that the sanctions regime has not gotten that much buy-in internationally. Now, we did, when the invasion happened, there was a vote uh, condemning the invasion in the, in the uh, General Assembly of the UN that got 140 supporters. That's a lot out of about 190 nations. Um, but most of them are putting their money where their mouth is. And there was uh, a piece in the Washington Post today that sheds light on this, good piece by Liz Sly, called uh, A Global Divide on the Ukraine War is Deepening. Uh, subhead, Russia capitalized on dis, di, capitalizes on disillusionment with the United States to win sympathy in the global South. And she leads a piece by quoting a, uh, a South African radio talk radio host. And at the, after the invasion, he was trashing Putin. Uh, and now what she quotes him saying is this, when America went into Iraq, when America went into Libya, they had their own justifications that we didn't believe, and now they're trying to turn the world against Russia. This is unacceptable, too. Uh, I still don't see any justification for invading a country. We cannot, but we cannot be dictated to about the Russian moves on Ukraine. I honestly feel the U.S. was trying to bully us. And I just want to say, I know this has been a little bit of a spiel. It's almost over. That, you know, those of us who make a habit of pointing to America's hypocrisy and pointing out that, the rules-based order is basically a system where we feel we can break the rules, uh, but various countries that we say can't break the rules can't. You know, we we get accused of, you know, being Putin apologists or what about us? And people say, well, why are you dwelling on the past? And the point is, it's not just the past. This has real term, like right now consequences, uh, real time consequences. Uh, these are among them. And, and and they have future consequences because until we reckon with the fact that we persist in this hypocrisy, we're going to keep paying a price for it. This is just one kind of price. There are lots of kinds of prices. I could go on. I mean, I personally think the various uh, violations of international law we've committed actually made the invasion more likely. That's another argument. But certainly a lot of the world you know, observes the hypocrisy that Americans are by and large blind to. Uh, and and it comes back to haunt us in various ways. And and uh and that's my that's my opening uh anniversary speech. Okay, I I um uh, I, I noticed that Biden 
he 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 hit the democracy versus autocracy theme pretty hard, and yeah. he's really conflating two things. We're 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 at war to defend the rules based order, which which means don't invade another country, and we're there in as in, as part of the battle of democracy and autocracy, and those are not the same thing. And one day they will conflict. One day a democracy will violate the rules based order, and an autocracy will be the victim. And uh, uh, which side do we? Which side are we on? Are we on the? Do we defend the defend the rules based order, or do do we defend democracy? He never even bothers to try to reconcile those things, uh, and probably it's alienating a bunch of these allies who we who aren't being on our side, as as much as the hypocrisy is that it, it's it's just an incoherent policy. It's like it's like when they tell you do what you do and do best. Well, what if what you do what you want, love to do and do best? What if you love to do what what you love to do isn't what you do best? But if you do best, isn't what you love to do? Uh, but if you're Kareem Abdul Jabbar and what you do best, you, you don't like that much, you know? Uh, it, it's uh, in in it, it, it's all sounds good, so they never even bother to sort it out. No, I, I you know I've argued that there are a ton of problems with the whole autocracy versus democracy framing. And one of them is it becomes a self-fulfilling. Well, one of them is it's another case of hypocrisy, first of all, because there are various uh, autocracies that we support, you know, like Saudi Arabia, and we could go on. Um, but it's also kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because when we do like sanction countries for being authoritarian or being autocracies, uh, it just drives them toward one another. And you're seeing uh, China more and more, uh, you, uh, you know, cozy up to Russia. Um, and in fact, uh, the U.S. is in the in the process of issuing, you know, very publicly these warnings. They're worried apparently China is now going to send arms to Russia, and they're warning them of grave consequences. I'm not sure why they're doing it publicly. There are pros and cons to that, but you know, it's it's. Uh, and it's the same with Iran. I mean, Iran is also on the sanctions uh, list, of course, for various reasons. They are uh, providing weapons to Russia. You just wind up driving these countries together, and uh, and it becomes a self fulfilling uh, isn't, prophecy. Isn't China obviously going to push Russia to negotiate? I mean, what do they? Why do they want to saddle themselves with a with a uh, country that's not doing very very well in the war? And threaten their commercial relationship with the U.S., which they desperately need. So, or which is a big deal to them. So, it seems to me clear that they, and they, if they said this, they're going to push a peace plan. Uh, they might very well play a constructive role, right? There, there have been pieces suggesting that, and suggesting that they they want peace. Although, ironically, maybe I mean, they, they in some accounts they want peace because they're worried about because they can see Russia is going to have to be their partner against the U.S., and they don't want Russia further weakened, so they want peace now. That's one argument. But, yeah, I mean, they could play a constructive role. But on the other hand, you know, it's like we, we're we asking, like, a lot of China. I mean, one thing about our foreign policy is is we 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 seem to be under the impression that there's kind of no end to the amount of things we can demand from everyone and actually get them. So like right now, we're demanding that China not supply China, uh, Russia right. with weapons, okay? Well, okay, but l just look at some of the things we've done with China. We basically declared economic warfare on them a few months ago or tech warfare with all of these chip restrictions, which by the way, involve coercing our European allies into doing things they don't want, but that's like a huge thing. You know, with this Chinese balloon, okay, we shot it down. Maybe we had to, but we also sanctioned like half a dozen more Chinese companies before we even recovered the damn balloon. We also canceled a meeting in China with it. And, you know, today I read uh, we're sending a couple hundred U.S. troops to Taiwan. I didn't even really realize we had trainers there. We had 30 trainers. Well, now it's going to be 200 trainers. I assure you that gets China's attention. And if you want them to comply with requests on one front that's very important to you, you just, you have to consider their interests as well. well it's a, it just, it just, even without that, it's a little weird that 
we can supply as many arms as we want to Ukraine, and the and they can't supply arms to their ally. I mean, they're a sovereign country. I don't think they'll uh, react very well to that. Uh, but I do well, think I, I mean, do there's think a distinction. They, Russia invaded, and we will emphasize that. But at the same, well, go ahead. What are you going to say? No, but uh, no, I just I I just think that, you know the in, in the realities of the situation are, are that uh, you know. There's, there's, China does not want to say, hey, this is our great ally, a country that can't even defeat this pissant country on its border. I mean, uh, uh, I no, agree. It, it, they, they, they'd rather not say that, but I think increasingly they see the handwriting on the wall, which is that we, I think they see us as wanting uh, a Cold War, a w wanting, you know, it's like, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, sanctioning them as we sanction Russia again. This chip stuff is hardcore, uh, and separate from that, we've you know declared war on Huawei and so on. We're doing this Taiwan stuff, which they consider very provocative, and we may be repeating uh, a mistake uh, that I you know that that may have led to the invasion in uh, in Ukraine. One thing one thing nobody in the blob considers is the possibility that that our ongoing provision of weapons to Ukraine. And the growing collaboration between Ukraine and NATO made Putin figure, well, I better invade now, right? Before things get even worse. And China, we could be making the same uh, I'm, calculation. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, I, 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 I sort of remember the Cold War fondly and uh, I'm less terrified by the prospect of a Cold War with China. But it's not, it's not clear what we want them to do. Become a liberal democracy. Uh, oh. Not be aggressive in the South China Sea. I mean, I guess those are all good things. What yeah, are the realistic? What are the realistic things we could expect China to do? Well, you know, this is what separates me from a lot of other left of center people. I think we we just cannot afford to set out to remake the governments of, of every country, and we have to focus on their uh, their external behavior. And, and yeah, we should care about what they do. I mean, in the South China Sea, with due consideration of the fact that great powers like to have a sphere of influence, but still, yeah, they shouldn't violate international law. Uh, there's various things they shouldn't do. Um, but I, I I don't think we should set out to remake uh, their form that, of government. That's also not why we're really worried about them. We're really worried about them because they're creating an Orwellian techno state within their own borders. That is a totalitarian nightmare, and and we don't want that to happen. Well, actually, that's, I, I think the concern ask. I think the concern you hear is that they want to, you know, spread that system globally, which I think is basically a misperception. Uh, but you're right. Uh, again, there are people who want to tell them how to run their country. I just yeah, but you can only that's ask a legitimate so concern. Much. It happens to be a legitimate concern that is a direct violation of the principles that they got to run their own country. Right, of sovereignty, which which is... But it's not it, crazy. No, it would be nice. If you could have everything, you know, I'd like a pony, but you can only have so much. And and uh, and to get back to your saying, you fondly remember the Cold War, well, I would say the Cold War was something we could afford more back during the first one. There are more urgent problems that have to be dealt with transnationally I mean, AI is a good example. We're all freaking out. And, uh, you know, to some extent, it would be nice to have international rules of the road as we try to figure out this AI thing more urgently is, you know, is good reason to believe. Uh, I think, you know, I'm not sure of it by any means, but that the, 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 the coronavirus escaped from a lab in Wuhan, I would say the chances are greater than 50%. And 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 that is like a a just a blazing sign that we need to deal with the with the fact that uh, you know we can't let genetic engineering proceed unregulated globally unless we want to see another pandemic that's worse uh, than 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 the last one possibly this time unlike the last one involving the intentional engineering of 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 a, of a bioweapon and. Uh, so, you know, we just can't afford that. We just well, cannot is, afford this shit. Yeah. Um, uh, I wonder, uh, I, 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 um, 
I, I, I called for a, uh, in, in, on Twitter, I called for a national commission to talk about the implications of AI, just because of this bug was put in my head by a guy I ran into a dinner who was a very smart guy uh, who said, nobody in the government is thinking about this, basically. It's like the biggest issue on the table and nobody's thinking about this. So, yeah. hey, but I wonder, is there any political purchase? If, if suppose suppose a, a Joe Biden or Ron DeSantis or Donald Trump or somebody said, we want to confront the AI problem. Does that win him any elections? It should, but I'm not sure it does. Probably not. I mean, you know, th there's all kinds of things that actually need doing that don't get that much political traction. Now, I suspect that the the virus thing, the regulating the, you know, uh, trying to get some international rules of the road on what you can do in laboratories and how transparent you should be, you might be able to whip up some understanding of that in the wake of the, the pandemic. But um, the AI thing seems pretty amorphous, even though I think it's, it's very important. But it, it's another one of these things that's scarier if, if the technology evolves in an atmosphere of intense uh, international Cold War-ish competition and opaqueness. You know, I mean, cold wars tend to make countries more opaque, less transparent. And, you know, I think the, I think the Chinese are going to be pretty opaque either way. Well, actually, no, the more economic engagement there is and the less cold war paranoia there is, the more we will know in a kind of organic way about what's going on within their borders. But also the more likely it is that you could actually get some kind of uh, treaty that uh, involves, you know, uh, systematic transparency of certain kinds. I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I mean, you know, we'll see. Uh, but uh, it's- They just arbitrarily threw their leading venture capitalist in jail, I believe, or he's disappeared. Um, look, I, that's a bad it, thing, but you know what it isn't? It's not our problem, okay? It's not in the category of things I'm talking about that are like existential threats to it, the planet. It, 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 it might be that it might be an indication they're not the type of regime to be totally transparent about all their moves. Because well, we know it happened. This one was, we know it right, happened, but it happened for mysterious reasons. We don't know. They're not look, transparent about look, why they did it. This is not, you know, this is not a direct threat to the well-being of humans around the world or to America. I just said reflects. You, you know, their, you gotta you gotta pick your you gotta pick their, your fights. It reflects their dedication to common cause, good government principles. There, uh, there's one thing I want to say about Biden's appearance in Kiev and his speech in Poland. Uh, if if his speech was designed to shore up support for Ukraine in the West, mm -hmm. and w which is falling among Republicans, I think about half of Republicans now do not favor supporting Ukraine. Uh, and the Mitch McConnells of the world do. I didn't think he did a very good job because he just sort of reveled in it, and he struck a good pose, and he he portrayed himself as a Churchillian figure, all of which he likes to do. But he didn't do a hell of a lot to convince uh, Americans uh, that it was their fight. Uh, that it, the ones who doubt that it's their fight. I mean, FDR went out of his way with various, you know, homespun analogies to convince yeah. Americans that uh, it was important to get involved in the Second World War. I don't see any of that. I just see, I just see, uh, you know, hey, look at me rhetoric. I just well, think it was a, a letdown in that respect. I think maybe one reason he's drawn to the democracy versus autocracy framing is he can say this, you know, Russia is a threat to American democracy. Of course, that's complete bullshit, but it's the closest he can come, maybe, he thinks, to, to selling uh, a massive commitment. I mean, meanwhile, you know, Trump is like preparing the ad they're going to cut because when Biden's in Kiev in the same week, Trump goes to East Palestine, Ohio, where that big chemical event was, where Biden hasn't been yet. And you, you can see the ad right now. It's like, while Biden was in Kiev spending our money on Ukrainians, I was with the people of Ohio. Ron well, sure. DeSantis I, is, also, is also talking this talk more. Well, they're all talking about it, but... Uh... I, I just don't see the East Palestine thing as such a big deal in the long run. It's it's a oh I can see a, it as a, a campaign. Railroad, it's a railroad accident. I think Buttigieg should have gone there earlier, and I think there's an argument on both sides. Of, obviously, there should be more. If there's a failure of regulation behind it, they should have more regulation. Uh, interestingly, J.D. Vance and 
uh, Marco Rubio sent a letter to Buttigieg sort of implying that there should be more regulation, which is weird for a, for a, uh, as Saraba Rami, is that how you pronounce him? The guy who runs Compact Magazine uh, pointed out, it was a very mature pro-regulation stance from a populist that admitted we should have an administrative state that regulates. Mm -hmm. The problem isn't the oppressive administrative state. It is that the administrative state fucked up in this case, maybe. Uh, They specifically pointed to some something called precision something or other that the railroads have instituted, which basically meant uh, they put more load on the cars than they did before. Mm -hmm. And since this accident was caused by a bearing that failed, presumably the bearing failed in part because there was a lot of load on it, uh, that that sort of is opposite. Uh, And it's also weird for a Trumper, a Trump supporter like J.D. Vance to call for more regulation since uh, that sort of fits in with Buttigieg's call for more regulation. He's trying to say, oh, it was the Trump deregulation that produced this. Uh, But I I give points to J.D. Vance for doing that. Uh, And... uh, Plus, it raises I the just, possibility of a Vance Buttigieg ticket, you know? <laughs> don't, I don't want to go there. <laughs> but, um, just a thought. Uh, I, it, I would, that's not, um, that's not completely crazy. Yes, it is crazy. It raises the possibility that Trump and, uh, that Trump and Vance, did they work this out ahead of time? I mean, is, is there a conflict there? One mm-hmm. day there's going to be tension between Trump and Vance. and. I assume oh. Vance wants to put it off as long as possible. Uh, is there? I mean, I don't know. Uh, but but yes, Vance uh, isn't crazy. Trump is. Uh, there's, I guess is he? Uh, um, I, I just quickly on the politics. I mean, I I I, I don't. I don't think it's crazy. I mean, I think it could be a good campaign ad. I mean, one thing. Remember, I think that this whole thing happened close enough to the Pennsylvania border that that got the attention of people in Pennsylvania, which is uh, more of a swing state than Ohio. Uh, anyway, I, I can, I can see Trump. I, I think we may see that in an ad while, while, while Biden was in Kiev, I was in Ohio. Uh, but, um, well, they, they, you know, DeSantis finally weighed in on Ukraine this past week. And I yeah, thought about, as a, as something of a, of a skeptic, right? Yes. He said, well, he did the, he did the safe thing, which is we shouldn't give them a blank check. Doesn't mean we mm-hmm. shouldn't give them aid, but it said we shouldn't give them a blank check. He said it's crazy to think that Russia is a threat to Europe, given their performance on the battlefield. Nobody seriously thinks that anymore. Uh-huh. And he also said uh, he also made the the, the the slightly cheap point, but not completely crazy point of why are we worrying about uh, Ukraine's borders instead of our own borders? And he said we not we should not go continue a war for Crimea and the eastern border of Ukraine. Uh, so that was pretty skeptical, but pretty responsible. Yeah. Like, sort of thought that was okay. John Shade wrote an attack on him saying he's put himself firmly in the MAGA America first camp. I thought he gave himself some wiggle room there. Uh, so, uh, so far, so good. Yeah, I mean, you know, whether whether he, I don't, I don't know there's any evidence that he feels this in, in his heart. You know, Daniel Larison in his uh, Unomia newsletter did a good piece just pointing out that, you know, Historically, DeSantis on foreign policy has been, well, first of all, inconsistent, but also largely hawkish. I mean, he, he doesn't have the kind of record he can point to and say, I've been, you know, I, I, I've been like a restrainer all along or, or a non-interventionist all along. Um, Do we care? We love converts. Somebody we love what? We love converts. Somebody who sees the light and stops being a... Uh, a hawk and becomes a restrainer. What do you got to kick? You're going to kick them out because they're they're too new to the club. Well, I mean, first of all, I don't like. I'm sure I wouldn't like the variant of restraint that he is even professing now. But I'm just saying, there's no evidence that it's heartfelt. Um, the um, he, uh, what I didn't realize is that he had he was on the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House, so it's not like he has no foreign policy experience. Mm-hmm. Well, plus uh, I think he's a pretty smart guy. I mean, you know. Now, you know who I heard? Uh, I heard an interview with Ro Khanna uh, to get back to my aspirations to to somehow get Joe Biden to leave the Democrat, <laughs> the ticket. Um, Ro Khanna is really good. He's really smart. He's as good as it's going to get on foreign policy. And, you know, I'm sure he's got what you would 
say, a political weakness. He presumably has, has gotten uh, more woke than is optimal in a general election. But I'll tell you, he is so savvy and articulate that he'll just be able to talk his way out of tight spots and debates and things in a way that is completely hopeless for a Biden. You know, uh, you're just hoping for Biden to finish his sentences. I mean, Ro Khanna is is a, a truly oh. impressive Democrat, and there aren't a lot of people I say that about. Presumably, there were all these stories, you know, the last week's conventional wisdom was Biden is unstoppable. You know, he, if he wants the nomination, it's his. The opposition to him is collapsing. Uh, this week, the inevitable story, why is Biden taking so long? He's put off the date of his announcement. Is he unsure? But his opponents are getting ready for him. You know, it's a story basically fabricated out of thin air that he might not run again. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, it's sort of hopeless to expect him not to run again. And, uh, and I do think Seems if he runs again, he's he's going to be uh, he's going to be formidable. And I, I'm going to say some words that I Never thought I would say they're the hardest words I've ever uttered, Bob. Oh, wait, let me guess. Uh, I think the refundable child tax credit isn't such no. a bad idea. No. Not that hard. Ezra Klein wrote a good call. Oh, God. And Nikki. He, he wrote a, he wrote I a good I just want to say that I feel your pain right now. <laughs> he, that, that must he wrote be a hard good column me. about how Biden, actually, his old age, actually helps him in some ways because he's sort of, he's this daughter, he's this sort of, doddering old guy who lets the leftists into the coalition and doesn't really object when they do their crazy woke things in the bowels of his administration. But he still seems like an old, uh, you know, an old Democratic Mondale type. And mm -hmm. that's a sort of a nice synthesis for the Democrats to have. My point about that is it's only a nice synthesis because they didn't pass the progressive part that Biden was pushing in Congress of the Build Back Better agenda, which would have been many trillions of spending uh, without discernible benefit to the voters immediately, except for the tax, child tax credit part. And uh, uh, so he, you know, he's like he's like a, a little, he, he's, he benefited from Joe Manchin blocking the Build Back Better. It's like that old story where the rabbi, you say, I'm in trouble, my, my wife left me, I lost my job. And the rabbi says, take a goat into the house. And you come back and he says, take a cow into the house, take a horse into the house. And finally he says, rabbi, I'm at the end of my wits. And the rabbi says, well, get those animals out of there. <laughs> um, so, so you know, the Build Back Better thing was so bad that when they got out of there, hey, Biden seems pretty good. That's the, that's the part that Ezra Klein missed. So I can live with myself because I found a part that he missed. Yeah, well, that's good. That, that, that was a close call. It was. Uh, I know he's a god to you, Bob. He, he is a god among men. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, the last thing I say about Biden, I guess I've said before, but I mean, you know, I remember it isn't just getting through the election. It's getting through a second term. And five years from now, come on, folks. I'm sorry. Just just do the just follow the curve from five years ago to the Biden of today and keep following it and ask yourself seriously, do you want that guy to be president? Uh, they're coming up with stronger and stronger Adderall. Well, I think it's I think they need more than uh, <laughs> it's a more than upping the dose. I think we need a whole new kind of drug. But uh, uh, I don't know. I uh, and look, he's he's. Eh, well, I've said this all. Never mind. Uh, can I say a couple of quick things about Ukraine? Uh, since this is the one year. Uh, yes. Part, just in terms of yeah. the current moment on the on the battlefield. Uh, I've been listening to a certain amount of Michael Kaufman. You know, he's this Russian mil expert on the Russian military. Who it turns out was born in Ukraine. I didn't know that about him, but but he's, you know, he seems pretty. He's got a pretty good record of being right. Seems pretty objective. Um, what he thinks is is going on. I mean, on the other hand, you know, the the Douglas McGregor view is at any moment now, Russia is going to launch this big uh, systematic invasion. I think there's supposed to be a big, uh, you know, big arm coming in from the north, from the south, and so on. Kaufman's view is that uh, they're they're testing the whole line. They've got at least you know five, six different you know kind of micro offensives, and they have enough troops in reserve uh, so that if they find a weak spot, they're going to try to exploit it, bring the troops there, and try to break through. And he seems, but he doesn't think they have enough troops uh, as he does the math 
uh, to to really launch some kind of huge offensive of the kind that McGregor seems to have in mind. And 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 Kaufman seems to think that uh, you got a, about another month to see if the Russians come through. He, he He seems to if they break through somewhere, he seems to think that they can't sustain things for a lot longer than that. He made one interesting point uh, on a different note, which is that I don't know if you remember when Putin replaced. Uh, well, first months ago, after the Russian setbacks uh, in Kharkiv, uh, he installed this guy, Serevikin or something, to be the new commander of the war effort. I think he, uh, Serevikin was around to orchestrate the very orderly retreat from Kherson and the shoring up of a lot of defensive lines. But then Putin replaced him with this guy Gerasimov uh, as, as leader of the war. I mean, Gerasimov was always uh, head of the, mil the military, head of the military. Um, and, uh, but now he's also in charge of the war. And Kaufman's reading is that Surovikin was trying to talk Putin, in, was saying, I think what we should do is during the winter, early spring, let Ukraine do their offensive weather it, let them exhaust themselves, we'll, be, we'll take advantage of that time to really train more of the mobilized troops, get our shit together, and then we go on the offensive. And Putin was too impatient for that, and Gerasimov told him, well, we, no, we can, do the, we can do the offensive now. And uh, Kaufman thinks that's a bad idea. It certainly hasn't panned out yet in a big way. And so, it, in effect, what's going to wind up happening is that Ukraine is going to be, in this scenario, may wind up doing uh, what was the Syravikan plan. They're going to weather, uh, try to weather an offensive, and then they're going to launch their offensive in late spring or something. That's the I idea. mean, Gerasimov has been there for a while, and there hasn't been an offensive, so. Well, no, now, he I mean, Kaufman, Kaufman, one thing Kaufman says is, this is the offensive. As I said last week, Russia is on more, many more points of the line than, than six weeks ago on the offensive. It's just that they're just making incremental gains. And the only place they seem poised to take a, a reasonable sized town is in Bakhmut. But, but, but Kaufman is among those who say, no, this is the offensive. It, it, it's not going to get more sweeping than this. It's just that Russia, if they can find a weak spot, Russia is going to try to exploit. They've got enough in reserve to try to exploit one weak spot. And that's what you hope Ukraine can keep from happening over in the coming month, six weeks, whatever. Um, it seems a very sensible strategy if I were pro-Russia. If you were pro, well, uh, yeah, but Kaufman thinks it's a mis Kaufman thinks they should have done, you know, Play defense, not even gone on this offense. Play defense. Oh, really? Let Ukraine tr try their offense. It, you know, Ukraine is going to try to cut through to the south, supposedly, to this Melitopol city. Okay. And and cut off the land bridge from between Crimea and Russia. Um, that's the expectation. And I, I, I think what Servikin wanted to do was let them try, let them wear themselves down, and then counterattack, go on the offensive. Uh, I assume people use the phrase rope it up for this. Uh, that would be a good phrase. It's, you know, Muhammad Ali, uh, as it happened, it may have wound up giving him Parkinson's disease. So that's not necessarily a, uh, an encouraging analogy for people who would, who would use this strategy, but he just used um, it in one fight, didn't he? He did, but you know, he also, well, I don't know. I think he used it more than one fight, but also it affected his training. He would let sparring partners, he, he wanted to toughen up his head. As I understand, oh, okay. he would let sparring partners be be harder on his head than was conventional in boxing. Huh. huh. Um, so uh, last thing is point that Coffin made. I may have said this before, but one reason if if neither of these offensive work, or even if one does in a way, to some extent, uh, with both sides using more and more relatively untrained troops you expect more in the way of long-term stalemate because you need experienced troops to conduct offensive. You can play defense with inexperienced troops. You can't play offense. And increasingly, both sides are playing with inexperienced troops. That's a good thing. 
Well, right? if you like stalemates, but it also but makes you wonder, like, what's the point? Can we stop this now? Don't, well, don't stalemates lead to negotiations? <sighs> Given long when, enough. When, but when, when, when both sides and when neither side has a, has a realistic possibility of a breakthrough victory. Yeah, but also in the longest run, remember, the Russians have the, the manpower advantage. If Putin can keep the people behind this, and I'm not sure we give enough thought to how often things we say and do feed his narrative that's just, that that helps build. Well, his whole current knowledge is that the whole world is against us. The, the whole Western world is against us. That certainly seems to be what Biden is doing. Convincing them. Right. I mean, that's what I wonder. It's no. like, OK, there are upsides. He's mobilizing the whole world to be against Russia. Well, he's trying. He's failing in that. But 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 what I mean is Putin's line is Putin's line isn't the whole world is against us. Putin's line world. is is. No, it's Europe, it's NATO, it's America. It's the Western hegemon. That's it. And that's right. basically the case. Nobody else is even on board the sanctions regime. Right, we agree on this. Yes. Right. But but my question is, like, going to Kiev is a good example. I am I know there are upsides to that, but I just wonder, does anybody in the administration say, think to themselves, oh, wait a second, this does feed the Putin merit narrative, right? You know, Biden hugging Zelensky in Kiev. I mean, that's what he's saying. Zelensky is his you know, is his little pit bull, is Biden's pit bull. Um, and that that's the Putin line. And I just wonder, because we've said and done a lot of things that seem to feed the narrative. I just wonder if we give that any thought. Wouldn't bet on it. I, I, you know, with Biden, you never underestimate the role of politics. He probably thought it was a good political stunt, too. Well, this worries me about all of our foreign policy, as as I said last week. I don't think that's the entirety of it, but I think that's part of it. Um, mm -hmm. So how are we doing on time? Let me check. Uh, my alarm clock says, oh, shit, five minutes. Why? What do you want okay. to say? I've got no, one quick I, thing I to, say, more go to say, but I did. I had nothing more to say about Ukraine, I don't think, except that... Uh, except that there was a, a story that, uh, that Putin is... the Russian sentiment against... Before the war is is exactly stable, hasn't gone down. Putin's been successful at keeping it where it is. They use the phrase hardening. I don't know if that mean what that means. It means you know the same number of people are for the war as before. He's pretending that the war isn't affecting the economy. So what you said about the good economy plays into that. Well, he's saying uh, it's a feature, not a bug. He said if you listen, you know, he had his State of the Union address and. Yeah. Uh, one theme I gather was, uh, you know, we're, we're we're gearing up the war industry, you know, jobs. It's like, and and, and they are gearing up up the war industry. Right. Well, that's what what I was going to say is wars are usually good for the economy. So why mm -hmm. should Russia be an exception? Uh, and uh, the final thing is that he was outraged by the activist NGOs that moved into Ukraine. And if there if there's any organization category of organization that's done more damage to the world than NGOs. I don't know what it is. They're the people who, you know, went to Afghanistan and said, now we need to inculcate Afghan women into all the subtle nuances of American feminism. No, we don't. Uh, uh, and it, I don't know, they're unregulated. They're, they're, you know, provocative. They probably, you know, or... Yeah. Um, oh, here's a question I want to ask you. You said that in in, in one sense... You wrote this this long uh, retrospective of what you've written on Ukraine. You said, in one sense, this this one guy you talked to convinced you to soften your attack on the American efforts right. in the Maidan. Yeah, this is well, how, relevant. In what way? In what way had, have you uh, softened your attack? This is relevant to the um, NGO question. Uh, his name is Ivan. I can't correctly pronounce the and totally <laughs> recall the last name. Is it care? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up. But he's he's such an interesting character. Grew up in Ukraine, political scientist at the University of Ottawa, and uh, he um, what he said is I mean he said two things. You you know there is this famous phone call where the Russians taped Victoria Newland talking to the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine uh, about who should be like, I think it's it's basically the next prime minister, I think. And then that guy that they agreed on, Yats is his nickname, indeed became the head of government after the democratically elected president fled the country 
uh, for fear of his life. You know, there were these arm. Um, you know, the, there were these right wing militias uh, trying to kill him, and they were they were part of the revolution. It was a violent revolution. But one thing Ivan said uh, is that is not as damning as it looks because when they were doing that negotiation, uh, when they were trying to figure out who who the guy would be. This was part of a deal that the president was in on. In other words, they were going to pick some guy, I guess, to be prime minister or whatever. But that was part of a deal orchestrated uh, by the EU and so on that uh, that the president was party to. I don't mean he liked the idea of the Americans secretly choosing who the guy would right. be. My point is that, it, and I don't either. I don't think that should be our rule. But but at that point. They were not necessarily saying this will be the guy who heads the government after we chase the president out of the Capitol, even though this guy became the head of government after the president was chased out of the Capitol. Now, Ivan yeah. also said, though, he said, but he said, so that part is less damning than it than it is often depicted as being uh, a useful corrective. He said, but the U.S. was involved in a lot of ways in orchestrating this thing. And I did not have time to follow up, and I want to have him back on the podcast and elaborate, but I will say, to your NGO point, it is certainly a fact that American-supported NGOs, some of which were funded directly by the embassy, not just by the National Endowment for Democracy, which is also a, 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 an arm of the U.S. government and also funds these things, but those NGOs did play a, a big role in uh, drumming up a non-trivial role in drumming up uh, support for the protest that morphed into a violent revolution. This is our alarm going off. And, and you know, look, I'm sure the people doing the work in the NGOs and at the media organizations funded by the embassy are these good liberals in the 19th century sense or whatever, you know, the, the broad sense, uh, doing what they think is right. But from Putin's point of view, I mean, even if he weren't a little paranoid, which he seems to be, if he were just a regular ruler with, you know, the 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 kind of hypersensitive concern for uh, for security on the borders that a lot of rulers have, you know, you would expect him to, to, to pay a lot of attention to that see it as part of an, uh, uh, an American government policy, which it was, and connect the dots. And I don't know how big a role we played in what became the overthrow of a president. But my point is, you, you fund a lot of stuff. When our government funds a lot of stuff like that, you should expect it to be perceived by the government that, that opposes these forces um, as an orchestrated plot. And that can have consequences. That perception can have consequences. It always seems that it's the Democrats who have learned how to deploy uh, the these civil society organizations. Uh, for you know, in in Ukraine would be one example. Also, you know, in the in American politics, all of the shadowy, uh, I think all the shadowy organizations that are private but are doing the Democrats' bidding, they're all on the Democratic side. I mean, obviously, if they're doing the Democrats' bidding, they're all on the Democratic side, but they're. They're they're none that are really doing the Republican spitting. Hmm. It's all I mean, it's all like they're they're secretly feeding Twitter the lists of people to ban. They're secretly reporting people. They're secretly blocking people. Uh, uh, you know they're 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 funding secretly funding elections like Mark Zuckerberg. There's no there's nobody on the right who's secretly funding elections to make them, you know, harder to commit fraud in. There's Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you know, funding elections as part of his civil society role. He has an NGO. Uh, so I, it just seems to me either the right is missing a bet or, uh, well, or there's I mean, there, something about the NGO the, structure that favors the left. There's certainly NGOs that are on the right. I mean, NGO is a, is, is a, is a broad term. There's certainly NGOs on the right. The other thing is, well, first, I mean, Twitter was sometimes responsive to concerns expressed by the Trump <clears throat> campaign. In fact, that's something that, you know, Tybee didn't emphasize as much as he might have. But um uh, but the other thing is, I wouldn't overgeneralize from the Trump era. Donald Trump freaked out the whole establishment with good reason, I think. He's a weird, crazy guy 
Um, and by the way, uh, um, he just to change the subject a little, you know, he uh, abandoned the Iran deal, uh, which crazy thing to do. And a little news flash from this week is uh, the U.S. ambassador to Israel said uh, eighty four percent. Well, there's that 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 their uh, their Iran is uh, enriching uranium to the eighty four percent level. Ninety percent is weapons grade. But the U.S. ambassador to Israel said uh, we will not stand by and watch Iran get a nuclear weapon. Number one, uh, number two, he and he's attributing all this to Biden. But he says all options are on the table. Number three. Israel can and should do whatever they need to deal with this, and we've got their back. That's new. We, we're Biden saying said that? We, the Biden US said that? ambassador to US Israel ambassador okay, right, was not okay. just some rich guy appointed to be ambassador. Right. He's a State Department guy from long right. of long standing. He's attributing that to Biden, and that's new. He's saying if Israel wants to attack Iran, we've got their back. That is alarming, and it's, it's new, huge. and it would not be happening at all. If Trump hadn't been president, because we would still be in the Iran deal, and uh, even a Republican, pre even a normal Republican president, wouldn't have gotten us out of the Iran deal. Anyway, this is something. Look, it's not crazy to think we could wind up in three wars. You know, we've got Russia proxy war, China, uh, who knows? Now Iran, um, and and uh, and the U.S. government is 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 being pretty edgy about all of them. It, it seems to me, but. I just wouldn't overgeneralize. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, people freaked out about Trump. The deep state freaked out about Trump. I, it, it's a perfect example, actually. The deep state is like the FBI doesn't generally favor Democrats. Trump just freaked them out. All of that's true, but it seems to me that my friends who are in shadowy dark money groups to fund Democratic candidates preceded the rise of Trump, and it's a function of too many committed activists on the Democratic side, especially too many committed activists with mm -hmm. money, uh, they got to have something to do to live with themselves. So if the government won't do it, they'll do it themselves. Yeah. I mean, there are obviously the, they're the Koch brothers. There are a bunch of you know dark money groups on the Republican side too. It just seems to me there's an asymmetry there. But you're right. Your point is more important. So the alarm went off. We got a transition to the parrot room. Uh, and so we're going to talk about stuff in the parrot room at patreon.com slash parrot room. I'm not sure how much we have lined up. There's always AI, of course. There's AI. There's, there's, there's what do Republicans say about Social Security? There's what if China develops a chat GPT? I guess that's AI. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, there's, there's plenty of things to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, I, I think I have a penetrating insight on the AI front. You'll be happy to hear. Okay, there's the fact that laxatives cause Alzheimer's, cause senescence, but we don't have to get into that. <laughs> oh, there's please, Fiona, Mickey, please, can we get Fiona, into that? Fiona Hill agreeing with you about NATO, sort of. Did you did you listen to her on? Uh, no, I unheard? read her on the web. Uh, anyway, uh, I listened to a podcast interview where I can talk about Fiona Hill. Yeah. So uh, should we do first laxatives and then Fiona Hill or the other? <laughs> Let's save the laxatives for last. Yeah, we want to keep them tuned in. And there's, uh, I mean, there's the most important news of the day, too. Mm. Carlos Watson was arrested. Wait, who's Carlos shocking. Watson? Who's Carlos Watson? Carlos Watson is the head of Aussie Media. Oh, he's that his, guy. He's, he's, he's Boy, the most, a... most promising black pundit of our generation. He's incredibly talented and I somehow he's completely fucked it up. He's a nice guy. Okay, well, let's talk about him. Anyway, I, re I vaguely remember center. the scandal. I didn't realize it, it had legal implications. It seemed more like an I think he thing. didn't realize either until today. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, we can talk about it. Or maybe the deep state's just trying to silence him, Mickey. You never know. Anyway. Uh, they're deep trace... The deep state's trying to silence us all. Anything? Uh, okay. Anything so, what? Do you, anything else? Do you, anything you want to plug? There's a bunch of other stuff I have, but you, you um, mentioned the thing you mentioned to mine is in uh, non-zero newsletter. It's kind of a, a a retrospective on a laxative thing. 
No, not the laxative thing. Yeah. The sedative thing, maybe, not the laxative thing. Okay, okay. Um, okay. I have nothing to compare with the laxative thing. Okay. Maybe we should just end this now. Put this, put this podcast out of its misery and move on to the pair room. Yeah, I thought that was the idea. Okay, so we're okay. moving on. See you there. See you oh! next week, folks.